Finally, we can consider a case that's a self-catalyzed case. So, for example, um, you know, one functional group uh, on one of these uh, monomers, A or B, may actually play a role as a catalyst to um, enable the reaction to progress. So in that case, we need to also consider the concentration of that monomer uh, as uh, in terms of its catalytic activity. So when we incorporate that into the rate law, say that monomer B uh, functions as a catalyst uh, as well, then we have uh, another concentration of B. So our rate law is K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B squared. And again, if we make these concentrations equal because we have equal stoichiometry, then we obtain a slightly different differential equation for our rate law, uh, where we have dc dt equals kc cubed. We can again solve this in the same way uh, that we did for the previous cases, and we just find that our relationship is a little bit different. Uh, so our concentration, one over the concentration of the monomers uh, in the sample, uh, which again is equal to uh, 1 over 1 minus the extent of reaction, scales with the square root of time uh, instead of linearly with time as we saw in the previous case. So there's a different time dependence, a weaker dependence on time when we have the self-catalyzed case, especially uh, at the later stages of the reaction because this is when the square root of t is going to be most different from t. And this makes sense because remember that as we're consuming monomer, we're also consuming catalyst. So in the later stage of the reaction, when there's less monomer present uh, in the sample, those are going to be the times when the reaction rate probably would be most affected by consumption uh, of monomer B. Okay, I uh, just want to conclude this point uh, by reminding you about the assumptions that we made. So we can get some basic insights and some rules of thumb about uh, how uh, the constituents and the nature of the reaction kinetics uh, will affect the properties of the polymer because those are all connected to the extent of reaction P, which is in turn connected to the molecular weights uh, and um, the degree of polymerization. But there's many other factors that can come into play if there's imbalances in the stoichiometry, uh, different reactivities of functional groups, if they're not exactly the same, uh, they have different rate constants, those are things that can cause deviations from these basic behavior. Uh, and actually, if those are understood, those are tools that you can use to control or manipulate the process to um, direct it uh, in a way that's most favorable toward the kind of product that you want to produce. Another thing that can happen is uh, that we haven't talked about is ring formation. So uh, functional groups just need to come into close proximity uh, in order to experience a reaction. Uh, so it's possible that a functional group on one end of a growing chain could find a functional group on the other end of the same chain, uh, and those two could experience a reaction. Uh, so that's called ring formation. So you can imagine that that process will change the molecular weight distribution uh, associated with the, um, uh, the product that you produce. It will drive it away from uh, the, the frameworks that we've talked about before. Uh, one way to deal with this is to just add more monomer uh, because then that increases the probability of interactions between growing polymers and monomers as opposed to growing polymers and themselves. Because uh, remember, it's all based on probabilities uh, of these interactions. Uh, it's also possible to have uh, monomer units that are um, provided in a cyclic ring uh, structure. Uh, and then the polymerization process involves opening that ring uh, to uh, allow them to expose the functional groups. But those are details that uh, come into play later. We're not going to focus on those uh, for this introductory uh, part of the course.